Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are joined by the town of Gander Mayor Percy Farwell. Surrounded by pristine wilderness and serene lakes, the town of Gander offers a tranquil escape from the hustle and bustle of modern life. Known for its warm hospitality, Gander famously hosted thousands of stranded airline passengers in the aftermath of the 9-11 World Trade Center attacks, showcasing its unwavering community spirit. Rich in history and culture, visitors can explore landmarks like the North Atlantic Aviation Museum or immerse themselves in local folklore at the Silent Witness Memorial. With breathtaking landscapes and a tight-knit community, Gander is a haven for adventurers and seekers of authentic experiences. So stay tuned as we will be right back with cross-border interviews featuring Mayor Percy Farwell. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Percy, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know the man behind the mayor's chair a little bit. And I've got to ask the question I've asked every single municipal leader who's ever come on this show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? I think it's, uh, you know, I grew up in this community. We Gander is an interesting community in the Newfoundland context. It's it's a community that hasn't been here. It wasn't historically built, obviously, on the coastline because of the fishery. It was built as a result. It evolved as a result of the uh, the construction of an airport. Where we're actually, you know, a, a unique situation where the the airport existed before the community did, and uh, and a community kind of built around it, right? Because back in the 1930s, uh, the, the we we weren't part of. Canada then at, at the time, obviously in the in the 1930s, or as we like to say, we hadn't let Canada join us yet. But uh, but uh, so so uh, you know the the Canadian and British governments were looking for a strategic location to build an airfield in anticipation of transatlantic flight, and uh, this this location in central Newfoundland it's a little bit of a plateau, good weather, you know, in spite of the snow you might hear of from time to time, which which is all part and parcel of it, but uh, generally good weather reliability and so on. So the, the the location was identified as a place for the construction of an airfield, which at the time was the largest airfield in the world. And, uh, you know, uh, no sooner had, had the uh, airport been constructed than the Second World War came along. And, uh, you know, this airport airfield played an integral role and a very big supportive role in the war effort with thousands of aircraft being deployed overseas from here. And then came the early days of transatlantic flight and all, uh, you know, all the who's who of the world. Every flight that crossed the North Atlantic had to land here. So uh, the, all the who's who of the world were passing through here every day. And but but all that to say, uh, initially, we were an airport and a community evolved around it. I'm like. A lot of people uh, in the early days of Gander who did not weren't born and raised in Gander because there was nobody being born and raised in the woods before the airport was built, and uh, so so I came here as a relatively young fellow, seven years old or so, my, with my family and grew up here, uh, participated in community life here, loved my. It was a young, vibrant town when 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 we approached, and we like to think it's continuing that way, although it is aging like most communities. Um, so it was, you know, it was a great town to grow up in. I took advantage of everything uh, that was here while I was growing up. I don't feel I was deprived of anything. I really, you know, so I developed a great, deep, a deep appreciation for my community. I was engaged in a lot of sport, representing the town and the province in a number of sports. Uh, was involved, have, I'm still involved in community theater here, have been for close to 40 years probably. Um, and, you know, just have a deep sense of loyalty to my community. And as I 
sort of got through my foolish teenage years and university years and and you know fortunately was able to settle back in Gander and ultimately married and um you know I I felt like I had something to offer I have some skill sets that I could offer to my community it wasn't because I felt nobody else could do this you know everybody else was messing it up so I had to come along and fix everything it wasn't the make make Gander great again you know that kind of thing uh but uh I uh, so you know I, I I thought that I had something to offer. I was at the time I ran initially for council here. I was I was the youngest person ever elected in in Gander, but I was in my early thirties, so that wasn't terribly young. But uh, and that goes back to nineteen ninety three actually, uh, when so, I first ran and, and was elected here. So, so let me just um, jump in there for a second because I've got to ask because Gander, Newfoundland and Labrador has the tendency to not have historical election results going back to the uh, the 1990s but i did read an article with you that you gave an interview that you, that that was the first election had you considered it prior to 1993 about putting your name forward or was municipal the first choice for you when you decided that you were going to give back in the political realm or had you considered uh, provincial or even federal or was it sort of that desire to give back to the community that you had grown up in since you, at the age of seven? It it, it, it was, I, I think, yeah, my first love was is community. But I, I was not a an aspiring politician all my life. Uh, it was a role that, you know, I felt I, I was would be comfortable in in my community. I haven't really pursued. I've had opportunity, but I've never pursued uh, election at any other uh, any other level and it's not really where my heart is you know partly because i'm you know the whole the whole concept of party politics is not something that i'm terribly enamored with and, and uh, you know i've i've uh, you know I'm, I'm more about uh, you know bringing skill sets to a table and not being encumbered by you know some overall policy that i don't necessarily agree with but i have to support and this kind of thing and i think that's what differentiates municipal politics from provincial and federal is this whole party system that you know it's it's the best we got i guess but uh, but it's something that doesn't uh, doesn't thrill me that much and and i you know and it is the uh, municipal level is the closest to the people closest to you know more hands on which means you know that has its pros and its cons obviously um but uh, no, I, I, I've never, you know, prior to 93, uh, maybe just leading up to 93, I hadn't really considered any level of politics. It's just that I guess I was at that stage in my life where I was settled into, you know, full time employment here in, in town. I was working with the with a provincial crown, crown corporation at the time uh, in the economic development field and, uh, you know, had settled, put down some roots, uh, re reestablished my roots here, I guess, after university. And um and it's kind of where I wanted to, you know, where I could offer my my whatever attributes I had that might be of benefit to my community, uh, along with a bunch of other people who would step forward. And um, so, yeah, it's 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 not something I thought about a long time. I wasn't an aspiring politician. And I've throughout the process, I haven't really been at any point aspiring for any other levels of of election. I mean, I, you know, it, it crosses your mind every now and then, particularly when someone suggests it to you. But um but it uh, hasn't really been something that I've, and now I'm finished my work. Uh, I did take, by the way, I started in 1993. I haven't been continuously on the council since 1993. I served three terms uh, up until 2005. And, and roughly half of those 12 years, I was deputy mayor here. Uh, and then by the time 2005 came around, I was still working full time. I was now, when I started, I had no children. By the time 2005 came around, I had a eight-year-old and a four-year-old and it was you know I just made a call in terms of my where my prior priorities for my time would have to be and and I stepped aside in 2005 to sort of you know help, help raise my kids and uh, stayed and, and always you know thought that you know when I'm free when I'm finished working and when the kids are older I might very much be interested in going back at it which is what I did 12 years later when my kids were you know whatever uh 20 and 16 or something so it so, seems um, like you have a uh the 12 uh number stuck in your head because you're on council for 12 years 1993 to 2005 take 12 years off from 2005 to 2017 you run for mayor in 2017 now yeah as we are the municipal show, I've got to ask the municipal question because you have a unique experience in this answer has municipal governance and municipal issues changed 
dramatically from the first time you were elected in 1993 to your re most recent election as mayor when you were reelected in 2021? Or are they the similar are they similar issues just on a more larger scale now? I think there's two answers to that. One is that you know some things are incredibly unchanged in in you know over 30 years uh the, you know the same issues and then the the same challenges that sort of thing so there's some some consistency over time but i think that the, the there's a couple of things that have really changed dramatically over that same period of time and and one of that one of those things is the advent of social media and the way the way the electorate can communicate with you the way you can communicate with the electorate how easy it is to get bad information out there and and how you know there's an expectation of being responsive to things that you couldn't possibly be responsive to uh, that has changed uh, quite a bit over the time and has presented challenges and, and it's probably a bit of a barrier for a lot of people that are interested in getting and in, getting involved and, uh, and the other thing is you know over the time because of the way our society has evolved uh, municipalities certainly in this province are becoming, you know, the, the challenges we, we, initially and, and, and to this day, I guess, the primary responsibility of municipalities is, is you know, basic services to your citizens, your water, sewer, firefighting, snow clearing, all these sorts of things. But increasingly now, uh, our challenges are social, socially based. And and municipalities, although not necessarily mandated specifically to deal with things in, in Newfoundland and Labrador anyway, we're sort of, you know, as, as a town in, in Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, our legislation doesn't mandate us to engage in, you know, directly addressing housing challenges, for example, or some of these issues and, and or, the, or the, the fallout challenges from, you know, addictions and, and, and all these sorts of things, right? So, but these are where the pressure points are in municipalities now. And... And, uh, you know, ultimately, if you want to simplify what our role is in municipal government, it is to be responsible for the well-being of those that live in our community. And that extends well beyond making sure they got safe drinking water and good wastewater treatment and good garbage collection and snow clearing. And so we have to find our ways to uh, use our resources and our energies uh, in, to collaborate and be part of solutions on social issues that did not occupy any of our time 30 years ago. And and now they seem to be dominating our time, right? So I think that's a big change over the over the years for sure. Do you do you see a blurring of jurisdictional lines though? Because I can imagine when you go to the grocery store, people will stop you and talk about the healthcare situation in your city town oh, yeah. or the education in your community, or like you said, some of those social services that are traditionally in the provincial jurisdiction. Compared to when you first got elected to now, have you seen just a complete blur of those lines where you're now, while understanding that it's not in your jurisdictional purview as a mayor, as a council, you have to address them in a matter that makes people feel like the town council isn't just ignoring the issue and being sort of forgotten about? Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't know about a total blurring, but but certainly there's... The expectations of your of your uh, citizens now uh, are, are that you 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 are engaged and you should be engaged in issues that affect them, uh, whether it's in your mandate or not, and and you are the closest to them, and and they do see you because we do make a point of you know we advocate on on issues that we don't necessarily control, we collaborate on issues that we don't necessarily control. So I guess to the casual observer who you know, who who may not be, be uh, all that in tune with, you know, the municipality's legislation or or where where those where one one responsibility ends and the other begins and so on. Uh, they, I think, legitimately have an expectation that, you know, as as an elected representative on the ground level in their community, that you should be engaged in some of these issues. And some people, when they approach you on these things, some of them understand that it's not stuff that's within your control and they're looking for they're looking for you to advocate and support and 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 try to be you know try to facilitate solutions uh, and others don't understand that and and expect that you are going to, you are responsible for finding the solution i had a call just yesterday from someone who you know wanted to talk about basically a, a housing issue in, in relation to you know the housing corporation affordable housing that kind of stuff that we are advocating and working closely over the last period of time, because we have, like everywhere else across the country, we've got a, a housing challenge uh, here at, at, at all, you know, on all bands of the housing spectrum, not just affordable housing, 
But uh, this person did not seem to understand that I was not going to be the one to to find the solution of how the, this person could get into, you know, the, the dwelling they were trying to get into. And they were dealing with a bureaucracy that I had no control over and that sort of thing. But the conversation kind of ended with, you know, well, well you're not going to give me what I want, so I don't want to talk to you anymore. I'm like, I'm, it's not that I wouldn't give you what you want, but I, I just can't, you know. Yeah. But we are advocating on the issue that would hopefully help you know, help relieve some of this pressure that you were obviously feeling, right? When I originally started this show, I, I, I thought that there was going to be a big apathy around people wanting to listen to municipal leaders talk about their communities. But what I'm finding is that there's actually a want and need. In the town of Gander, do you see an apathy when it comes to what's going on at town hall? When you go talk to people, are they willing to give you their opinion? Or are you seeing a, a general sense of, as long as my garbage is picked up and my water's <laughs> turned on and my property taxes are low... I'm content with what's going on at town hall. Yeah, I think there's a there's a bit of both, you know. That, that depend that'll vary from person to person. Some people are some people are happy to engage or you know have the same sense of duty to their community as we do as elected officials and and understand that you know we're just a bunch of people that got elected to provide leadership and develop policy and and try to move the community forward in a, in a progressive manner and and you know we need all the help we can get and and the input we can get. We're just in our case, you know, six councilors and a, and a mayor. We're just seven voices from the community representative of the community we're not the only voices in the community obviously so some people get the the fact that you know they they are uh, they are valued their their input is valued and then they step forward when we because there's people out there in the community that have you know certain types of expertise and experience that we don't collectively have within our own group and uh, you know we need to we need to harness that too so some people understand that and some people would as is human nature some people would prefer if they're not they're responsible for doing it they they feel their responsibility is to sit back and criticize it you know so so um you know you get both and you have to you have to you have to be uh, you know we're very appreciative obviously of those that choose to contribute positively to uh, to very challenging issues you know and and we need a you know in every community large or small you need a sort of all hands on deck approach to addressing uh, some of these uh, you know very large challenging issues we face and uh, and we're appreciative of the engagement of our community we know that uh, you know volunteerism is getting heavily heavily relied upon for almost every aspect of our society and and there's a limit to what you know those that are inclined to uh, help there's there's a limit to how many hours they have to help so so you know but we appreciate every every uh, bit of uh, and we seek out, you know, input on, on when we're dealing with issues like health care, uh, these sorts of things, you know, um, we, we certainly seek it out and, and appreciate the community being engaged. But uh, and some will, like I say, some some feel that their their duty as a citizen is to be the official opposition to the town council. And that's OK, too. You know, like we need to be held accountable uh, on a reasonable basis. And, you know, and and we need to have thick enough skin that when people don't really understand where where you know our responsibilities begin and end that we have to have thick enough skin to be able to endure some of that and and when we get pressures on us to 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 maybe act in ways that that are and is not necessarily in the best interest of the entire community but more specific to an individual's grievance uh we have to have the you know uh, the fortitude to to resist that and do the right thing as opposed to the most comfortable thing which is to say yes to everybody right Okay, so you bring up a good question. How do you know? Because at the end of the day, you are the one who makes those votes. You and six or seven other people, yourself seven, um, mm. make those decisions. You have to make sure you're doing it right and doing it for the greater good of the community. How do you personally ensure that the decisions you make are going to benefit the most, but not impact the people who are mm. struggling the most? I, th I think you 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 know you have to or in my case anyway uh, yeah I think there's a, a lens you apply to all issues and 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 you know largely for me it is to ensure that I mean I have to understand that I don't know everything I'm not aware I don't bring every perspective to the table uh, I have certain skills to be able to assess information and and you know develop some thoughts around uh, but it, but it has it, you know uh, I, I'm not uh, you know, uh, it's, it's not all about my, my opinion, right? So I think 
you know, if you understand that and you seek out, I mean, I, mean, I don't like to make a decision that I haven't tried my best to uh, consider all sort of angles and perspectives that, and some of those perspectives aren't necessarily the first ones to come to mind. And certainly maybe would never come to your mind based on your own personal education and history and, you know, uh, experience and, and so on. So I think, you know, being prepared to, uh, or, or understanding that, you don't hold all the answers. You don't hold all the uh, information you need to make a, a decision on, and and being comfortable that you've you've you know uh, done what you can to understand all the aspects of of a particular issue, and then you know what people elect. The way I view it is what people elected me for was to do that, to to do the due diligence, and not just go with the first you know not, uh, uh, phone call I get. Uh, but then to to use, you know, I, I feel they've elected me to consider that information and then use my own judgment as to what is in the best interest of the community, right? And, is it, and there is will it, be those that will disagree. Is it important for you to listen to both sides of the story? Because we always have our unconscious biases within our own selves to say, hey, I have my five people on social media that will always talk to me and give me their opinions, but they're usually the opinions that I have, hence why they're on my Facebook page. Or yeah. I'm going to go out to my local arena and the people who I usually talk to are maybe friends who I've known for 20 years. How important is it for you to listen to both sides of the story when coming to that final decision? Because Across Canada right now, people are about to go to the polls in Nova Scotia, Saskatchewan, Northwest Territories, and Yukon to elect a new council. We have people who listen to the show. What advice would you give a prospective councillor or mayor to ensure that they don't just have that unconscious bias and do their due diligence mm -hmm. as you've done in your time in office? It's critical. I mean, and, and that's the only advice I would give people. It is critical to understand that you, your own background, your own, however you arrive at your own opinions uh, on things, uh, you have a, an obligation to explore, other, you know, what uh, what other opinions might be out there and to con contemplate them. You don't have to agree with them, <laughs> but you do have, an, you know, and but you have to, you know, apply uh you know some rational thinking to to what and you have to be prepared to accept that you know what i hadn't really thought of that aspect and and based on that i'm not so sure i feel so strongly the way i felt maybe i feel maybe i i see a, a perspective here that i didn't really think of before and 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 that doesn't mean that that singular singular perspective is one you make your decision on either but you know i think uh, in the in the whole and collectively uh, that's that's what you have an obligation that's, uh, to do, and I think that's what I would advise anybody that's involved in in decision making on behalf of an electorate, is to consider that the electorate the electorate is not defined by one or two phone calls or nasty Facebook messages or that sort of thing, and um, and it has to you know there has to be an open mindedness. I mean, obviously, when you start out, when you think about any issue, the first you know your first inclination is that well. This is what I think about it, and clearly it must be right because I thought about it. But, <laughs> but that's not the case, and uh, and you have to be open to hearing other perspectives, and you know, and putting them into the mix, and then make your decision. You're still never ever going to make everybody happy. That's another thing I would remind anybody in elected office of is that if you're looking for you know 100 consensus on any issue, you will never make any decision right, and and. So you have to be prepared to, you know, to, to, to balance things out. And maybe sometimes it's not the perfect solution, but it's the one that works best for everybody and these sorts of things. But uh, Understand that's what, that. yeah. Oh. I was going to turn to segment two because I'm cautious of time here. And I want to talk about the town of Gander as a whole. But before I do that, I'm going to preface it, as I always do on this show, that this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is the mayor's opinion in his opinion alone. He has one vote of seven on town council. Don't know why, but we still get emails to this day about this question. I have a question. Uh, my question to you, though, Mayor, is in your opinion, what do you believe are the biggest issues facing the town of Gander today as of recording this? The biggest issues we're facing today, I think, are, you know, uh, they're, they're, they extend well beyond the boundaries of, of the town of Gander, but they influence the town of Gander. And sometimes they're 
created by forces that are outside of even our ability to control you know but but i think the biggest issue facing the uh, facing the community the biggest issues facing the community now are things like you know for example we we are a we're a growing we have a growing population here which is a great thing uh we are becoming an increasingly diverse community which is a great thing um but we we as a result of that we have challenges in the, the particularly in social issues around things like housing like um and like um, you know are the limitations in the workforce which is was unheard of decades ago when or maybe not multiple decades ago but not too long ago it was unheard of that there would be a challenge in keeping you know a business open because you couldn't get any employees and, and these sorts of things so a lot of these global issues that are affecting you know large small communities across the country are certainly affecting us as well um we are a uh, we're a community that you know was founded as i said at the beginning of this we we're we like to say in the newfoundland context we're we're an airport not an outport and and um you know and and we've we've evolved into a, a major service center because of our geographic location within the the province but you know at our core we remain uh you know connected to the aviation sector and we know that particularly post pandemic that is a very challenged sector and and um, so so you know things that are happening globally uh, affect us significantly uh, in the aviation and aerospace sector in particular, right? So, you know, resilience is the is the key, and uh, our community has been resilient over the years. We've had some major losses to the community over time, but we've managed to rebound, continue growing. So, so I, I don't know if I'm being specific enough for no, for you you me. are because it gives me a, a good jumping off point for sort of the follow up question to that. And I, and I say this with respect because I want to make sure I say this correctly. These issues are not municipal issues. Global, global issues, federal issues around airport, social issues around housing and workforce, they're very much yeah. outside of the jurisdiction of the uh, purview of the municipality. But you know and I know that you are the closest to the people. You don't go to St. John's. You don't go to Ottawa and do your job. You're in your community 24-7. What is council doing to sort of alleviate some of these pressures that you've talked about in the short term until the federal and the provincial governments get to the table and say, OK, Gander, OK, Percy, let's sit down and have a conversation around aviation sector or let's have a conversation around workflow, workforce employment. So that way, Gander has a leg up moving into 2024, 2025, 2030. Yeah, it's it's on all those issues. It's around understanding your lane and uh, and you know uh, uh, being being a bit, doing what you can with the resources you have and with the mandate you have to uh, to collaborate to uh, you know to work work collaboratively with the other levels of government on issues. You know the, the federal and provincial governments will acknowledge that you know there's certain certain issues that are within their respective jurisdictions and so on, uh, but. You know, if we're truly interested in in finding uh, solutions, we need to be, you know, taking a an approach, a collaborative approach with other levels of government, acknowledging that you know we each have a role to play. That uh, and and you know that that's kind of what we're doing. And like in the housing example for uh, housing issue, for example, you know we've we've embarked on we've done our own research around how. Uh, you know, certain models that are being used across the country for trying to address housing issues, whether it's through, uh, you know, municipal planning, uh, land use planning, uh, zoning, that sort of thing, or, or uh, you know, encouragement of investment in, in high density, higher density housing and all these sorts of things. Some of these things we control through our zoning, through our regulations, these sorts of things. Um, but but that doesn't, you know, independently doesn't doesn't help resolve anything. We need to sort of recognize the overlap in our respective mandates, and we're, we're we've we've engaged a consultant to to do an updated uh, housing needs assessment for the community that we are using in you know and and the provincial department that is responsible for the housing issue in the province is is you know cost sharing it with us 
and because we need we need to get a we need to get a real clear indication of we, we, never mind the uh, sort of the anecdotal uh, you know evidence uh, around what where the pressure points are we need something that we can hang our hats on in terms of you know dedicating resources to and or other levels of government are dedicating resources to them so we're we're doing we're doing that we're trying to sort of articulate and, and better define uh, the issue in the case of housing and doing what we can uh, you know around reviewing our own regulations looking at potential incentives for uh, for encouragement of, of development looking at some uncomfortable decisions about you know taking uh, rezoning uh, uh, what previously open space land in the core of the town and, uh, and permitting a higher density residential development on it in order to accommodate those that come to our community and uh, perhaps don't have, we don't have public transit in our community, and uh, but we have a lot of uh, new Canadians, immigrant workers coming that are helping keep our businesses running, and they don't have vehicles necessarily, and they need to be able to be able to to get to their place of work conveniently and so on. So, so you can't just say, well, why don't you just build someplace on the out outskirts of town? Well, they can't walk an hour to and from work every every day and that sort of thing. So, so all these sorts of things, you know, we're so, so we're doing things so like that. Um, is there buy-in from the community? I apologize to interrupt, but is there buy-in yeah. from the community? Because when we talk about housing, we, we talk about the, the role the municipality, the federal and the provincial governments have. But at the end of the day, there has to be buy-in from the community to say, hey, I'm willing to accept the fact that if we grow, that makes their my, my potential property taxes go lower or stay the same as we increase service levels. Is there buy-in from the community to say, you know what, Percy, you're doing a fantastic job, continue doing this, and let's continue to grow in a manner that's sustainable and is not being done on the backs of the people who are already here? There is buy-in. Like, like I said earlier, you know, there's no such thing as 100% consensus. <laughs> uh, <laughs> shocker, to any, shocker to anybody that might be involved in politics. But uh, there is, there is, there are, you know, people there, there are volunteers in the community who are working with us towards solutions to a lot of these challenges and so on, right? But there, there will, you know, whether you're in uh, a tiny town much smaller than ours or in a small town like ours or in a large city, you will always be confronted with the, the nimbyism and the, you know, the, uh, the if, if a solution, you know, we, we agree that there needs to be a solution. We agree there's a problem. And we agree that, you know, the angle you're taking is probably not a bad one, but you shouldn't do it in my neighborhood, you know, and that sort of thing. So, so you get, you know, you get varying degrees of that. So, and, and uh, I guess it's human nature and, you know, you wouldn't expect anything any different, I guess. Right. But, uh, but that is you know, the, the whole concept of this, not in my backyard is a challenge to addressing some of these issues because, you know, the solutions well, there's always some some level of compromise, you know, from the in terms of the 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 life you're you the community you're used to, and you have to in some ways, um, you know, uh, reinvent not reinvent your community, but you know, you you do have to compromise certain things in your community in order to uh, affect the solutions that are going to help your community grow and continue to be the and take advantage of opportunities and 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 really uh, and not just take advantage of opportunities, but be the place, the the welcoming, uh, accessible, inclusive community that we seek to be. Gander is a fairly prosperous community, uh, higher than average, uh, higher than average family incomes. You know, in, the, on the, in terms of the national numbers and so on. But that doesn't mean we don't have people that get left behind with the costs of housing and so on, because the cost of housing here is is higher than most small communities in the province. And and uh, so we, we recognize that as we grow, we you know we need we need to be accommodating and including people at all you know all ends of the economic spectrum as well. And we know that as important as healthcare is to to us, and we advocate strongly for it. Uh, we understand social determinants of health and know that you know. Yeah, people have to have roofs over their heads and be able to eat sensible, decent food and so on in order to take pressure off that health system. And at the end of the day, like I say, our our uh, our ultimate responsibility is pretty simple. It's to is to be mindful of the well being and, and to uh, support the well being of those who choose to live here. And we would like to think that we are a community that people, a lot of people would would choose to live in and raise families in, and they don't all make. The high incomes that perhaps uh, you know a disproportionate number of people here do because of a certain couple of industries that are here, 
And um, so we have to be, you know, inclusive and and uh, and accessible and affordable to live in. And um, and you know, we we can't be any more mindful of one end of that economic spectrum than we than we are of the other. And so, you know, we have to be do so. Uh, yeah. So how do you balance the needs and wants of the community versus the needs and wants of the individual? We talked about the greater good at the beginning of the interview, but if I go talk to 100 people in Gander, they're going to tell me 100 different issues that they believe are the most important issues. And they might be micro issues. And let's be honest, they will be the pothole, they will be snow clearing, there'll be service levels increase, and they all cost money. But you as a council, you as a mayor have to balance the needs of the macro issues, growing the community, sustainable growth, infrastructure repairs with the individual to make sure that they don't feel like their issue isn't important because to them, it is the most important issue that they have. How do you balance the micro with the macro issues in the gander? It's it's never easy, and, and it's not you know it's not, and and the, and and that question is not specific to Gander, I don't think, right? But, oh, it's uh, a question I, I ask think, all, and it's always fun to hear what mayors and councillors say when I, I ask think that. I think it's you know uh, fundamentally, it's a lot of it is around uh, communication and engagement. You know, like you you need to you need to be able to take the pulse of your community, uh, and you need to be able to communicate exactly what it is because things can go pretty wacky, pretty fast, particularly in this day of social media and so on, right? And mm -hmm. and uh, what you may or may not be doing or why you may or may not be doing it can be misconstrued very quickly and can become take on a life of its own. So I think a lot of that is understanding the importance of engage, community engagement and, and communication with your community. And sometimes that means, you know, uh, laying out and, and articulating why you're doing something that maybe is particularly distasteful to a fair number of people in your community. And but, you know, maybe when 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 provided with the rationale for it and, you know, we have an obligation to have a rationale for it. It can't be we can't be doing stuff on a whim. So, uh, you know, I think that is uh, that's largely how you how you try to balance these things. And, and is it hard to and, say no to people? Because uh, sometimes they just is sometimes their their asks are just too unrealistic for the financial realities that municipalities are under right now. Yeah, absolutely, and and yeah, it's, it's hard to say no, but to to people for for certain things. So now some people, you know, uh, depends on where where the where where the person is coming from and some of their their engagement with us and so on. But yeah, it's hard hard to say no. Nice to say yes to everything. Um, that that's true of our own person. You know, anybody's had kids or you know, <laughs> you know, it's it's true of your household, right? It'd be nice to be able to say yes to everything. Reality is, you can't, and and you have to find that balance. And uh, you have to do what, you know, sort of optimizes the resources that you have. You, you can't just sort of, uh, there, there's not limitless, resor limitless resources. And, and uh, so, you, so you, and, and you, that means you also seek out partnerships, seek out collaborations, whether it's with the public sector, whether it's with the private sector, with the, with the volunteer sector, you seek out uh, those partnerships and, and areas of collaboration so that collectively you can accomplish what uh, individually you could never have a hope of accomplishing, right? And the more people are engaged, the more they, they if they don't uh, uh, agree with what's being done, they at least understand what's being done. And they, they understand that it's not just a bunch of people sat around and didn't contemplate anything, just the first thing came to their minds, what they decided to do. And so, you know, as long as you can explain to people, we've looked at this from all these angles and these are the options we've had to consider and doing nothing is not one of the options. Uh, so unfortunately the option we're going with is one that you are not uh, delighted with, but you know, it's, it's in the best interest of, of resolving the, the important issue, which ultimately has an impact on you. Uh, so, you know, and, and so, but uh, like I say, it comes back to, engagement and, and communication and, and nobody's perfect at that we're transitioning in terms of the resources here here at town of gander anyway in terms of the resources that we put towards that you know back just six seven years ago when i became the mayor here we didn't have a a position in the in the town hall that was dedicated to communications we do now and we have functions of other jobs that are that are increasingly becoming part of that. We just, in this year's budget, we approved funding for a new position, a community engagement officer. 
you know, to to which which would help us engage with members of the community, with other organizations in the community, with other levels of government and so on. And someone to sort of quarterback some of these things, you know, and, and do some of the grunt work too, and some of the legwork on on these sorts of things, right? So so years ago, nobody had communications officers and engagement officers in their town hall. And now they're among the, you know, more critical positions you probably can have if you if you want to effectively govern with you know with the limited resources that we that we all have and and you want to effectively deal with uh, some of these um, evolving challenges that nobody even contemplated many years ago and you're trying to do it in the context of a of a world that involves social media where where it's so easy to, for bad information to get out and so easy for poisonous commentary to become accepted as as a legitimate argument right I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I am cautious of time and I want to turn to my last subject because I think it's the most important one. And anyone who is anyone in Canada has heard of your community, but I'm assuming they've only heard about it because of an incident that took, not incident, but a world event that took place on 9-11-2001 where air traffic was stopped and airplanes from across uh, North America landed in Gander and 6,500, if I'm not mistaken, the correct number, you'll probably correct me, were stranded in Gander and Gander took up arms and opened up their doors and became known as a world destination in a small town in Newfoundland and Labrador. Mm. As someone who is about to come to Gander this year, as I've made a promise oh. that if you come on my show, I will come to your community and I'm doing a massive swing through Newfoundland and Labrador and visiting every community that has come on. So Gander will be on that stop. What are the hidden gems? What are the tourist destinations that people need to stop, including myself, when in Gander, <laughs> Newfoundland? Yeah, well, uh, uh, first of all, yeah, the, the actual number for people was uh, 6,595 by my count. Uh, I was I was a deputy mayor here at that time, actually. Um, and, and there was 6,595 people, 17 cats and dogs, and two bonobo chimpanzees. That's what we had here for four or five days, and none of them had the benefit of any luggage. So it made for some interesting times. And, and yes, it has been celebrated, and, you know, uh, we, we don't find it. I mean, we we appreciate the the recognition. We think that the people here did what people would do. You know, if we were just blessed with the opportunity to help those people, they they literally dropped out of the sky uh, at a time when we were watching these tragic events unfolding south of the border, and and human nature would be that you know we you'd be uh, wondering you know or wishing there was something you could do to help somebody, and we were just presented with the opportunity. So. So, uh, you know, and, and we didn't decide to write the musical. Somebody else did. And, and uh, you know, and, and we're very appreciative. And there's a production of it playing here all last summer, all this summer, professional production uh, that brought like 15,000 people to town last summer. They're running 48 shows here this summer. So to segue into your answering your question, certainly one of the, you know, as as a result of that, uh, that, that the event and the, you know, the, uh, the notoriety it has and the very positive uh, re, uh, light it has shone on, on our community and on our province. Uh, we do have uh, a lot of people just want to come to be here. They are inspired to come here to meet some of the people, to to get a feel, to get a sense for what this community is all about, that it's almost it's almost taken on mythical <laughs> proportions, right, to, of, of what happened here. And, you know, we're just normal people that... Uh, that you know want to help people when they have problems and and I think there's you know those exist everywhere we don't have any monopoly on that so so we do have you know we are that we, we are the community that you can come to Gander has because of its unique uh, uh, history in terms of the evolution of the community itself we we are an airport first then a town uh, and the reason we are an airport first and the, and the whole that whole evolution has involved a significant global impact and, and connection to aviation. So there's a lot of aviation history in this community that people perhaps don't really think of when they think of Newfoundland and Labrador, when they think primarily of whales and icebergs and, and nice people and quaint vill villages, right? They don't think of it as you know, as in the case of Gander, the, the place where the Beatles first set foot in North America or or where, you know, where the Queen came to officiate over the opening of the terminal building. Such was the prominence of the airport in 1959 when that new terminal building was built. So the, the history, uh, you know, or the fact that 
you know, people like Frank Sinatra, Marilyn Monroe, all these people were, were frequent flyers through this community for years and years and years. And all through the Cold War, uh, the, the, the Russians and Cubans flew through here and had crews stationed here and walked among us while they weren't allowed to even land in the, uh, in the U.S. And, and so on, right? So we've got an interesting, it's not just a domestic airport where, you know, some people manage to get into and out of the, uh, the province from time to time. There, there's global prominence, global significance to our connection to uh, aviation. You know, the, the Second World War effort, when, when there was in excess of 10,000 aircraft assembled and, and flown out of Gander to, to the war theater in Europe and all these sorts of things, right? So, so we, we've got that history and there, there are opportunities in the North Atlantic Aviation Museum that sort of uh, tells the story of a lot of that stuff. And in the newly refurbished or, um, yeah, I guess refurbished uh, International Lounge, which has restored that iconic International Lounge at the airport, which is recognized globally as a, as a, you know, a wonderful time capsule of mid-modern architecture. Um, you know, part of the uh, refurbishment of that and the reopening of it to the public involves an uh, interpretation that tells that story and of, of, of the, the prominence of the airport when it was built and through those glory days of transatlantic flight when everybody who was traveling, every flight that was crossing the North Atlantic uh, going east or west had to land in Gander. So just 20, a 24 seven operation if you, and locals could go to the bar there, the same as, same as passengers would. And if you went up there on any given day or night, whatever time it was, you could very well rub elbows with Frank Sinatra or whatever, or most recently say a lot of the, uh, because that, that technology now has kind of passed us by for the larger aircraft and so on. Right. But, but still a lot of the private aircraft come through here. John Travolta was here just, last week or a couple of weeks ago, you know, hanging out at the terminal, checking out all the interpretation and, you know, the, the women in the kitchen trying to get him to dance to, to something for Saturday Night Fever, which I'm sure he's quite, quite tired of having to do. But, uh, you know, he hear frequently a lot of these people, right? So, so that's, that's kind of a vibe that's in town. A lot of things you'll see around the town at the airport, at the aviation museum are tied to that. There's, you know, you, you mentioned the, the whole 9-11 uh, story and our connection to that. And, you know, we wish none of that had happened, obviously, because we wish that those attacks had never happened and we never had to uh, do what we did. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, it's not, that's not the only time we've been connected uh, through tragedy to particularly the United States. We had the Aero Air Crash of, of 1985 when, when 256 U.S. citizens died right off the end of our runway here. You know, 248 of them were soldiers coming home from a peacekeeping mission for Christmas. Very tragic story. And, uh, you know, this, the, that site is a, uh, is a uh, you know, a highly frequented site because it's done up as a, as a memorial park there now and, and a place for people to go and reflect. We get uh, visitations from people connected, you know, and that happened in, like I say, 85, it's quite a few years ago. We've had thousands of people come through there uh, that are, that either have a direct connection to someone that passed away there or have an interest in it because of their citizen or citizenship and so on. Uh, there's a lot of that. Now, so that's, you know, in Gander, that's kind of what it's, that's what we are, right? That's where we've come from over our history. There's a Sabina air crash. We, we sometimes call it the, you know, if, if you want to give a range of tour in Gander, you can give them the death tour, right? Where, where people have died in various, very, various. Sorry, I shouldn't uh, laugh, but that was hilarious. No, but, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, but, but it has significance. It has, you know, uh, very uh, historic events, you know, uh, that have happened here uh, tied to uh, aviation. But, you know, probably as much as any, or maybe more than anything, what, what Gander has evolved into as a community is a, a hub for some amazing tourism product that is in our greater area, right? Like the Twilling Gate, or like the, the legendary Fogo Island Inn, you know, that people from around the world go to. It was one of the you know, top 10 accommodations places in the globally uh, for people to attend uh, to uh, visit. Um, you know, and 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 all the the stuff that people like to come to see in Newfoundland and Labrador, like the whales, like the icebergs, like the quaint villages, are being now, you know, have have had good product built up. There's good opportunity. You can you can come here and 45 minutes from the town of Gander is uh, is an operation where you can actually go with a group of people out in a boat and 
catch sharks on a, on a, on a rod and, and you're not killing the sharks, you're, you're catching the sharks and they're being tagged for DFO purposes, but, uh, but it's, you know, it's a, a blend of a, a tourism opportunity and, a, and an exercise in, in science, you know, and a, an important piece of science. So there's, there's all sorts of things that we are, we are a sort of a, a hub for, we have a lot of accommodations here, but there's some nice accommodations out around the area too. And a lot of people tend to come and, establish a base here and explore this region so that's i would encourage anybody that's coming to to not limit your re, uh, research on what there is to see in gander but to uh to look at that sort of surrounding area there's there's a lot of opportunity for some really amazing amazing stuff right and we're only happy to to feed you and give you a, a roof over your head for a night or two but we would encourage you to go and spend as much of your money as you can in some of these other communities around us as well right because we're all at the end of the day we're all just one large community here in central newfoundland and you know a lot of the people in these smaller communities around us rely upon gander for their retail for the government services their health services and 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 we rely upon them and our businesses rely upon them to come here and and spend some of their hard-earned money you know so so we're all one really big community and we'd encourage uh, people to come to Gander to yes by all means we've got lots of we've got three uh, three different pieces of the uh, World Trade Center sitting in various locations here in here in the town of Gander there's one in front of my office here in front of the town hall it's one at the airport and there's one at the uh, aviation museum actual pieces of steel from one of the World Trade Center buildings. So another one just down the road in, in a small park in Appleton, a neighboring community that was that was also actively engaged in that whole process uh, on 9-11. So there's things like that that are of significance to people. They like to come and, and see. Um, but so there's a lot to a, see in the area. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you to do a little bit of a Sophie's Choice here for a second, if you don't mind. What's the thing that you do? After a long day of council meetings, after a long day of meetings with provincial and federal and even in in town meetings with residents, where do you go in the community to decompress? Where do you go to let it all go and recenter yourself knowing that tomorrow morning you'll have to do it all again to make Gander better off than you left it the day before? Well, I'm 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 a well-established Ganderite. I have a good circle of friends here. I'm in, yeah, I'm still in even as as in my role as mayor, I'm still engaged in community theater. This evening, I will be going to a rehearsal when I finish up here. I'll be going to a rehearsal for a show we're about to present uh, in Easter week in the provincial drama festival. Uh, what show? I'm, Do you mind me asking what show? It's called Appropriate. It's it's currently playing on Broadway, actually, uh, which is unusual to to go into secondary licensing while you're still open on Broadway. But it's uh, it's a, sort of a it's a, it's it's a show something along the lines of August Osage County, where for so for a dysfunctional family is is convening after the in this case after the death of the patriarch and uh, and a lot of things are being revealed about about the whole family and and the dysfunction and so on. So any, who, who, who are you so, playing? I've got to ask. I've, I I got to go down this rabbit hole for a second because I'm a Broadway <laughs> fan. Who are you playing? Inappropriate. Well, I'm I'm uh, I'm uh, Franz or Frank, who's. You know whose history is as a as a pedophile. <laughs> I was about to say, um, there. Are you sure you want to be playing Frank? And and has shown up, you know, with his much younger fiance and uh, that sort of thing, right? But uh, no, I so I really enjoy that, and that's that's a real. I mean, you want an escape from reality? Can't get much more of an escape than that. Do doing shows like that, and we do a lot of comedy and stuff too, and 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 you know we. We, it brings together a lot of people that might not otherwise spend a lot of pe a lot of time together. So it's a great social thing as well. So that, I do that a lot. I, I do. I still like to golf. I still like to get out. We have some beautiful uh, trails uh, here for for walking, and I have a, have a beautiful German Shepherd that likes to likes to have as much of my time as she can possibly have when when I have it. To uh, you know, and I don't give her enough of it really. To be honest, I still have my you know my family around me. Uh, and the circle of friends and everything, isn't it? And, and, you know, we're living in central Newfoundland. We have a lot of options for outdoor experiences and that kind of stuff. I have a, I have a boat that I use on Gander Lake, which is just right there on our doorstep, which is 50 something kilometers long and, and uh, two or three kilometers wide and about a thousand feet deep in the middle. Uh, so, uh, you know, in summertime, you get a few times to go there. That's the kind of stuff I do. But I mean, we, you know, we're, we're a small town. 
getting bigger. There's it used to be that there was nobody in town I wouldn't recognize and probably didn't know where they lived. That doesn't, yeah, you know, it's not the case anymore. Now I now I struggle sometimes when someone says they live on a particular street and and it's if it's one of our recent streets, I'm like, yeah, tell me again where that is. <laughs> but so uh, I, I'm but, gonna. You know, I want to end the interview with the, the million dollar question. I started by talking about you and I asked you about your duty to serve. We're ending by talking about the town of Gander. And I want to know from you, in your opinion, what makes the town of Gander such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? I think it's, as I've said, in, in response to a couple of other things, you know, it's like it, we are relatively unique in the Newfoundland context uh, we do. We are uh, probably a little more diverse than most communities, uh, certainly of communities of our size. Um, we are. I, I like to think we're a very progressive community, and and I'm really encouraged when I meet people in other areas and who and they find out where I'm from, and 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 they describe our community as you know as a progressive community. Um, it's so so you know it, it, it's. Uh, I think that makes it kind of special in in the, and and like I say, I think our uniqueness in the Newfoundland uh, context, you know, is is kind of uh, uh, kind of interesting, and and uh, we have a role to play in this province. Why I'm I'm you know I'm I live in Gander. I've lived in Gander since I was seven years old, so that was you know fifty six years ago or something. So, um, but you know, my roots are from those quaint fishing villages. My parents were from. You know, little communities, little outport communities in in northern rural Newfoundland. Uh, my uh, part of my DNA is certainly there. I spent a little bit of time living there in my early days, and I have a great appreciation uh, for outport Newfoundland and rural Newfoundland. And and I, I like the fact that being in Gander keeps me in a in a relatively cosmopolitan place, but very close to all those things that I love about about the rural Newfoundland roots that I that I have. You know, but some people describe uh, well, maybe I don't know if some people do. Maybe it's just us to describe it ourselves. But uh, we sometimes describe ourselves as the suburb of a city that doesn't exist, because that's kind of what Gander is is like. You know, we have we have good resources. You know, good uh, good assets here, uh, good amenities and services and. And a, a, I like to think a forward way of thinking, and and uh, and we try to encourage that and and continue that, and uh, so uh, it's it's a place that you know a lot of people come to and don't leave, and 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 uh, and you know it's 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 a place that until the 1950s nobody was from. Everybody everybody came here uh, to do something. Initially in the 30s, it was to build the airport, and and then it was. To be, they're in the military, someone's military, and they were in bases built around the airport. And then they were, then they were working with airlines. You know, we had representatives here from airlines all around the world who had stations here, and uh, people living from countries all around the world. So we we were, you know, diverse then, right back in the early days. So it's kind of it's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting community in in uh, that respect, and and uh, it's, it, I think it's part of what makes gives me the vibe that I get when I'm in this community. And, and I, and that's no, you know, I'm not, I certainly don't want to diminish any other community. I, I, there's a lot of communities in this province I, I love, but I choose to, I, I have chosen to stay here from, for re, you know, for a reason, not because I didn't have any option to go anywhere else. Right. Percy, I want to thank you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know the life of a municipal politician is always crazy, and it's always appreciative when people like yourself sit down and talk about themselves and talk about their community. We've only known each other for less than an hour here, and it feels like I, I, I know you personally. And I'm not sure if that's the gander way, but <laughs> you, you seem to have a passion for your community, and I feel like I can say this with respect. Thank you for serving. Thank you for being on council and making the tough decisions. Uh, it is probably challenging some days, but you seem to be doing a great job in guiding Gander into a better future. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity to come on with you and look forward to meeting you. You say you're going to come for a visit. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming you'll look me up when you do that. I will be looking up every counselor <laughs> there who's ever been on the show. So thank Perfect. you. And I, I look forward to that as well. 
Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations like today's episode on the cross-border interviews. And even enjoy an eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of the top-notch content you have come to enjoy over the years. Now, if you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.